let's move on to the YouTube specific metadata portion. Personally, the title of a video is one of the first things I come up with at the very beginning of the process. It can almost serve as a primer for the whole video if it's good enough. Or it ends up being literally the last thing I come up with after I've established and codified whatever my theme or message is. I find that it's either the driving force behind all of what comes after, or it's the culmination of everything that came before. And then, of course, it's almost always made worse in an attempt to appeal to the YouTube algorithm gods. Again, this is another thing I'm trying my best to figure out what the fuck to do here. Like every other YouTuber who takes this seriously, this is a personal Sisyphean struggle. Now moving on to composing the description, this is pretty simply just a summary of the video, which considering that I wrote an outline in the beginning and a script, should be pretty easy. Every now and then I try to toss in a teaser somewhere in there, all the while trying to be clever about sneaking in search terms to just, oh please god increase this video's discovery even just a tiny bit. Who knows if it works. Next, I'll return to the collection of references, attributions, and links I collected along the way that I mentioned before, and place them in here with some pretty formatting where it makes sense. You're really going to want to avoid getting called out for stealing content or not giving proper attribution when all it takes is a simple mention and a link, and that usually does the trick. Now, if something that you reference is on YouTube itself, and or if I've taken considerable and noteworthy chunks of it, maybe like a 20 second clip from someone else's video with assets that they produce themselves, or I explicitly referenced it and said I'd provide a link to the video because I recommend you check it out, I reserve these links for what's known as YouTube cards, which I'll get to in a moment. And finally, I'll toss in the timeline I created earlier when I was doing the final quality control pass on the video, and add it to my description with the proper format. Now this is a newish feature specific to YouTube that adds little chapter sections to the timeline so people can quickly navigate between sections or find something specific in the video. Now, YouTube tags are something I recently had my entire understanding turned upside down about. I don't know anymore. You're on your own for this one. Now, if the video is related to a particular game, I always make sure to add it here. Now, almost all of my content fits into some sort of conceptual bucket, whether it's a theme, a video game, a series, or whatever. I create playlists for all of these things where it makes sense, although ironically enough, I don't think I've got a playlist for a video like this, although, oh, never mind. See, I guess I was more forward thinking than I expected. Now once the video has been uploaded and it's passed a certain threshold of processing, I'm able to do the last few steps in the process. Given that my channel is monetized, I configure my monetization settings. Now I'm not about to tell you how this works or what the best practices are. I'll leave it up to you to read YouTube's shit and follow their rules. Good luck. Now at this point, I do a once over check to make sure that the auto generated YouTube ad breaks aren't ridiculous. Sometimes they're perfect. And sometimes they just go fucking buck wild and cover my video in ads like it's some sort of bukkake prank. Now this is just my personal preference, but I try to avoid running more than one mid-roll ad within a 10 to 12 minute section. And if the auto-generated ad breaks don't break that rule, I just keep whatever they've got. But like I said, sometimes I need to incorporate a scorched earth policy and delete literally everything and then go through and manually place them where it makes sense. At this point is where I take the YouTube links I mentioned and create cards for them, as well as configure my end screen. Because I have a consistent template I use for my video outros, it only takes one or two clicks to set this up. And more often than not, it's just importing the settings from the latest video and maybe tweaks made here or there every now and then if the prior video is much different from the latest. Now I know that there's a ton for me to learn about how this end screen stuff works and best practices here. I have some ideas. Again, I, I just don't have time yet to dive into it. Now finally, I give everything a once over, double check the title and thumbnail for typos, which are the most embarrassing. and. And then I'll set it to either be private if I'm not sure when I want it to go live, or I schedule it to be public. As soon as it goes live, I try to write a pinned comment straight away, hoping to get some engagement, some feedback, shout someone out who deserves it, or maybe just tell people reading it that I appreciate them. So, now that the video is done, my baby's out in the world, what are some of the things that I hope I've accomplished? Some of my goals I've hoped to achieve, some of the qualities I hope my content has been imbued with, and what can I take away from the experience for the future? How can I stay true to myself while also trying my best to have every video be better than the last? One thing I've tried to stay loyal to is the idea of finding or developing my own style. It's impossible, at least for me, to not absorb bits of inspiration from literally everything I consume, whether it's consciously or not. I find that my particular style of writing essays flows directly from my normal conversational style coupled with the media that I enjoy. If you happen to be familiar with my sort of brand of content, you and I have likely both recently found myself using, probably overusing, metaphors to explain all sorts of things. 
Now, I'm actually quite self-conscious of this often, as I know it can come off as, like, mansplainy or perhaps even condescending to some, as if I need to dumb something down for somebody. But ultimately, the reason why I do this stems from a few different things. The first is that metaphors were incredibly useful for my own personal learning and development and understanding as I was growing up. Now, in some respects, I am a visual learner. Show me a diagram, an animation, a video, and I'll get it. Sometimes I find that I learn the most when I'm not reading about something or not listening to a lecture or a guide or a lesson, but instead experiencing or doing something for myself, learning from my own trial and error. Very often I didn't have access to the first two or those first two failed, or perhaps whatever I was trying to understand was more abstract or complicated, so when somebody would break down a concept and explain it using metaphors, relating it back to something that they knew that I understood, something from my own experience and knowledge that I could draw from, more often than not, that's when I had those aha moments, finally coming to understand something that up until this point, I hadn't yet. Now, the second reason why I love using metaphors so much is that naturally flowing from the first reason I just mentioned, it's an exercise that truly tests my own understanding. It feels kind of like a metacognitive mini game for me. So this over here is me, and this over here is somebody that I'm having a discussion with. Let's imagine I'm trying to explain something to them and they don't quite understand. Now, chances are it's because I'm doing a bad job at explaining and or there's something that they're missing or some preconceived notion that's causing them to understand something wrong. And by using my prior experience, my intuition about who they happen to be, whatever it is I know about them and can deduce based on whatever interactions we've had up until this point, I can try to get creative and figure out a more approachable package that I can deliver my message in. You have to know your audience. If I understand the essence of the thing that I'm trying to convey, if I have an accurate understanding of how and what they're confused about in particular, and if I have an accurate understanding of them as an individual, perhaps I can empathize, put myself in their shoes and see things from where I suspect their perspective is. This might provide me a glimpse into maybe what their confusion is. I can take my understanding of the essence of whatever I'm talking about, take what I've learned about them and what I suspect, and repackage it in such a way that I think they can absorb. Now this is of course not always the case, but Honestly, I find that it's successful more often than not. With better success, the more that I know somebody, and this serves at least for me as the ultimate test of my own comprehension of not only the concept in question, but more importantly, the person on the other side of the conversation. I felt quite strongly for a while now that what's lacking in the understanding of the average person I encounter today are the abilities to identify and understand the abstract, and in many ways, the ironic. In Letters to a Young Contrarian, authored by one of my personal heroes, Christopher Hitchens, we can find one of my favorite ever Hitchens quotes. The literal mind is baffled by the ironic one, demanding explanations that only intensify the joke. At the end of the day, there's no right or wrong way to go about writing a video essay. What works for me might not work for you and vice versa. Now, of course, what I just said is admittedly an example of something that while true is simultaneously completely and utterly devoid of any practical use, there's nothing for you to take away. There's nothing actionable. It shares this in common with one of the most ubiquitous pieces of advice that I hear some content creators, let's be honest, most content creators give to those aspiring to do the same. Hmm. All right. Basically, right. What you need to do is you need to make your novel stand out more. Uh, yeah, can you elaborate on that? R right, w right. Well, basically, you've got to make it so your novel is different from others on the market, which will make it better, because it's different. Of course, being different and standing out in and of themselves aren't bad things. In fact, they're very likely required for any amount of success. So what's the problem? Well, the issue arises when inquiring minds are given advice that is incomplete. The conditions may be necessary in solving a particular problem, but they aren't sufficient. There's more to the picture than what's been presented. In their endeavors, something vital will be missing, critical concepts or ideas ignored, and unfortunately it's all too common that most that follow unknowingly incomplete advice and end up failing are left to the nearly impossible to avoid conclusion of misattributing the cause or the misapplication of blame. So the goals of standing out and being unique aren't wrong, they're just not the full picture. So where do we go from here? 
To try to answer this question, allow me to shed some light on the most important underlying ideas that I hope will give you the needed perspective, perhaps even inspiration to have the best chances at succeeding at creating the kind of content that you'd be proud to create. To do that, let me tell you a little story. I spent the better part of the afternoon yesterday building some furniture, although I suppose using the term building here is a bit misleading, or I guess at the very least ambiguous. When it comes to furniture, I've personally done all sorts of things that you could call building, although many of these endeavors were quite different than others. On one end of the spectrum, you've got something that came in a box, pre-finished with all the hardware, tools, and directions needed to assemble it fully. And I can put these sorts of things together in no time as long as I've got the energy or maybe a bottle of wine. I'm basically on autopilot. It might be nice quality, it might be exactly the thing I needed, but I couldn't say with a straight face that I created it. Now let's move a bit along this spectrum of creation and look at something I was considering doing a few years ago related to another of my passions, guitar. I wanted to fill a void in my collection, adding a Telecaster style guitar to the arsenal and was talking to my dad about the idea of buying a kit online and putting one together. Anybody can buy a guitar kit like this and slap together their own unique custom Telecaster and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I find there's something admirable about this process as compared to just grabbing a production model off the wall at Guitar Center and taking it home. Now, interestingly enough, the old man convinced me not to, because he's the type of guy that would take something like this to the next level. There's a lot of ways to describe Pops, he's a lot of things to a lot of people, but one of the things that I've always admired most about him is that he's a prime example of someone existing on the far end of the spectrum. He's a tinkerer, he's a creator. He's a builder. We chatted for a bit. He asked me some questions. I gave him an idea of what I was looking for, picked out a few pieces of hardware and electronics, and I ordered a few blocks of some really nice exotic wood on eBay. And then I waited. Now he's a busy guy. He's got his own stuff going on, family stuff, work stuff, his own hobbies and interests. So it took a couple of years of on and off work whenever he could squirrel away some free time down in his basement shop. There were a few mistakes and learning experiences along the way, but what would you expect? This is his first time ever building a guitar, truly building a guitar from scratch. He's a software engineer by trade. He's not an experienced luthier. He's never been a professional carpenter. He's not the most skilled or the most knowledgeable in those disciplines. He's not the most experienced. He doesn't have the best equipment. It's not like he hand forged the tools he used in the building process or cut down the trees from which the woods were harvested himself. He didn't come up with a totally unique design. He just built the Telecaster from some raw materials and some plans. So what's the big deal? Now you'll have to forgive me, but in my opinion, there's really only one way that I can appropriately answer that question. Because here is the real number one tip I can give you when it comes to not just being an essayist, but being a creator in general. Find a way of creating videos that only you can pull off. Or in layman's terms, find your voice. 
My dad isn't a carpenter or a luthier. He's just a dude who's passionate about learning, teaching himself new skills, welcoming of experimentation, failure and the experience that comes with it, and isn't afraid to be who he is, dive into the things that he's interested in and share these interests with whoever will listen. My old man found his voice a long time ago, and it's only been over the last few years that this has both become clear to me and started to rub off on me. In Hitchens' 2004 piece in Slate, remembering the late Susan Sontag, he recalls something that she had said in an onstage discussion some 20 years before in New York. Susan, pressed to define the word polymath, was both sweet and solemn. To be a polymath, she declared, is to be interested in everything and in nothing else. You don't have to have been born a natural, already having the skills or the training. All you need is the interest and the desire to absorb as much as you can from as much as you can, as well as the intellectual honesty to understand the extent of your knowledge compared to the extent of your ignorance. In order to be confident that I understand the content I consume on all of these subjects, I need to learn as much as I can about them. Now, I don't use the term need here lightly. I don't mean that educating myself on these topics is a mere prerequisite. I mean I literally need to learn about them in the same way that I mean I need food and water. In fact, I often find myself foregoing these basic necessities, or perhaps forgetting them, when I'm deep into studying or creating. In his video on how to make a video essay, The Closer Look asks us a poignant question. How can you provide insightful analysis when you have no insight? The insights I try to provide through my video essay style content are not insights created because I'm an expert on anything, it's not because I'm the smartest or the most clever or the most creative or the hardest working. There are plenty of examples of content creators in the communities that I exist within that are far more of any and all of these things than I. They all have skills and knowledge and abilities I simply don't bring to the table. But luckily for folks like you and I, none of that matters. The most interesting insights, the deepest and most valuable lessons, the most fascinating and compelling stories we have to share are the ones that only each of us has the ability to tell. Nobody else in the world has the exact combination of knowledge or expertise that you have, coupled with the myriad of different and often completely contrasting passions and interests that you have, and none of them have lived through and experienced all that you have. I found that the people who have been the most influential in my life are the ones that not only have the ability to entertain, educate, or change my mind, or humble or inspire me, but they're the ones that tell the types of stories that only they could tell. The more I consistently try to expand each of these aspects of my life, experiment with combining as many elements of each together in as many different creative ways as I can to then share it with whoever's willing to listen, the more I'm pleased to find I have in common with those influences my heroes. I want to say thank you for sitting through this little series of mine. I hope that it's in some way empowered or inspired you to find your own voice, and I look forward to hearing some of your stories, the ones that only you could tell.